Great, a lot of light, so I, yeah. Hey, Denver, my name is Abdurrahman Omran. I'm leading the developer relations at Cartesi. Today, we are going to enjoy a meaningful discussion together. So, yeah, before we start, anyone heard about Cartesi before? Okay, nice. Majority is not, so that's why we are here. We are having like a core contributors from Cartesi. Please prepare all your hard questions. They love deep technical discussions. So, yeah. First time to Denver, and uh, I really like the city. I like people, the attitude, the vibes, everything. I don't like the weather, but yeah, everything else is really great. So yeah, first time to Denver, and I'm very excited to be here with you at Eat Denver. Um, so what, what are we going to cover today? We are going to cover four segments about Cartesi. The first one is going to be a high level, very high level uh, overview about Cartesi. What is Cartesi? What we do? What we are trying to solve? And second, we are going to go through a showcase. Uh, what are real world examples that you can see, that you can build uh, on top of Cartesi? What are the uh, real use cases? And next, how does it work? And then we are going to go even deeper and see how can we technically, uh, practically, step by step build on top of Cartesi. OK? So yeah, let's start with the first one. So what I'm go going to cover is the first high level overview about Cartesi. What we are trying to solve as Cartesi rollups is two main challenges. The first one is computational scalability, and the second one is programmability. How we are going to change that, or how can we solve this, how we are trying to fix it? Uh, before talking about how we are fixing it, let me tell you a, a quick story. It's about a banana, not a blockchain. I'm going to use a very basic metaphor. Let's talk about, let's forget about blockchain for a minute and talk about banana. The banana doesn't have to be uh, 10 times X just because there is a casino down the, down the road opened and suddenly become very popular, right? And that's actually what's happening with the layer one blockchain. A lot of applications, a lot of users are competing for the scarce limited block space, right? And that's why everyone is competing for the same limited resources and with the popularity of Ethereum blockchain, with the, with the popularity of the layer ones, basically, the more dApps, the more users comes to the layer one, the more slow, the more expensive it will be, right? So for an application to be viable, for an application to be uh, meaningful, it has to hold itself in this war, in this resource war between a lot of dApps, a lot of users using this layer one, right? And for that, you will find dApps, your new dApp that you deploy on that layer one competing with other popular dApps. They are competing for the same resources. They are competing and bidding for the same resources, for the same computational attention that node runners verify the network uh, uh, state. So why this is a problem? We believe this is a problem because everyone is looking for a global consensus. Every single dApp, every single user is looking for a global consensus for everyone to verify the same transaction, right? And that's, in our opinion, the more popular the network becomes, the more it becomes a huge problem. It's going to be slowing the whole network, making it more expensive, and at the same time, don't give the scalability that you need for your, for, for your own dApp. And by that, like, the network itself becomes gentrified and the innovation will be hindered. That's why we are thinking about something that should be more scalable, and that's what we are trying to solve. How we are going to, uh, to solve that? We are talking about modular blockchain uh, architecture. How? Like, it's, a, it's about modularizing the blockchain architecture that, we, that you have. Uh, we are talking about execution, about settlement and consensus, and specifically local consensus, not global consensus. So for Cartesi, we choose to go away from global consensus. It doesn't have to be everyone in the network competing for the same resources and everyone in the network verifying every and each single action for every app, right? So that's, what, that's why it doesn't make sense to have everyone in the network, all nodes, all verifiers, validating all transactions at the same time. In our opinion, we believe that every user, every app should be verifying only the transactions they care about the uh, roll-up specific transactions. 
the application transactions they care about. That's where rollups, uh, um, that's where uh, application specific rollups comes into play, right? And with that, we are embracing the application specific concept, the application specific rollup concept, where your application will have its own rollups and the network of your own application only will be verifying the, these transactions for your own DAP. With that, we can have, uh, like, we can open the doors for uh, a lot of, um, like, new generation of DAPs. Just imagine that if you can have uh, this flexibility and this scalability, just imagine what's the opportunity that we can have here. So, to recap this part, to recap this part, we are talking about Cartesi as a rollup speci application specific rollup solution uh, that can run as a layer two on top of Ethereum or as a layer three on top of Arbitrum or Optimism. So if you are using Ethereum, you can use Cartesi run to run on top of it as layer two. If you are using Optimism, for example, as a layer two on top of Ethereum, you can use Cartesi on top of uh, Arbitrum or on top of Optimism as a layer three. Let's go back to the uh, world computer analogy that uh, some of us like talk about Ethereum as a global or world computer, right? Uh, we think about rollups as the universal computer, something that's much bigger than uh, the Ethereum itself. Ethereum enables that. I Ethereum gives us the, uh, the, the, the foundations. And this layer one, you can think about it like a sun in the middle and everything around it like the, a constellation, planets, revolving around this sun, right? And one of these planets could be Cartesi. Like, you can think about this as Cartesi rollup. About this as a Cartesi rollup. This is maybe something else, another rollup and so on. So that, that gives us, like, more flexibility to build a faster, more powerful, and more sophisticated dApps on top of the Ethereum ecosystem itself. That's the first one. That's the first challenge we are trying to solve, which is computational scalability. The second challenge we are trying to solve is the programmability. Before we talk about programmability and what we are trying to solve here in details, let's talk about the software engineering in general. Software engineering, like it's been a couple of decades, developers and engineers have developed many layers of abstractions. Every layer on top of the other one. And all of these layers actually hides the complexity and the uh, information of the lower layer, right? You can think about it like, let, let's look at this diagram. There is operating systems, tools, libraries, uh, compilers, uh, interpreters, and so on. All of these built on top of each other, starting from the base layer, which is the uh, platform architecture itself, the operating system, the low level uh, languages, the machine code, the high level languages, and so on. And on the top, you can develop your own app using these high-level programming languages. So why, why we should go and reinvent the wheel when we are developing for the blockchain? Why not we can use all of these tools on the blockchain as well? Because it's already battle-tested. It's been decades for engineers that have been using it, has been developing it, and that's what we are trying to do. That's where, what we are trying to do is just to bring the uh, well-tested tools like Python, C++, the Linux operating system, and everything that it allows you to do with it, right? And that's what we believe in. We are trying to bring Linux operating system on top of RISC-V architecture into layer two optimistic rollup solution. And with that, you can just think about the opportunities that you can do on top of uh, that layer. So with that, we can say hello to Python, C++. You can use your own database, decentralized database like SQLite or something similar. You can use uh, Python to develop your uh, DAP and to connect it to the smart contracts. You don't need to be limited to the limitations of Solidity or any of the existing development tools. You can basically use any of the uh, uh, tools and uh, languages that you already know and love and, using, uh, and you are already using on top of Linux, right? So yeah, with that, we, we, we are saying hello to Python, C++, uh, C++ uh, JavaScript, SQL, and so on. This is a very quick example. How can you uh, develop a very simple DAP on top of Cartesian rollups? Most of you, like, you already have seen something like this. It's a Py Python script. With three lines of code, you can import any native or third-party library in Python. If you are using Python to develop your own DAP, you can use 
any native or any third party library included into your DAP, and it's as simple as that. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, and that allows you to use something like image recognition. Uh, you, you can use machine learning, you can use any of these complex uh, uh, like uh, uh, technologies within your DAP. You, you are not limited anymore to the limitations of the existing development tools. Yeah, so that comes to the basic question, which is what is Cartesi? And w w what is Cartesi exactly? It's a general purpose roll-up solution. It's infrastructure for application-specific roll-up solution. You can use it to develop your own DAP on top of it. If you are using, uh, if you are using uh, Ethereum as your base layer, you, as your layer one, you can, use, uh, you can deploy your application using Cartesi on top of Ethereum. If you are using Optimism, Arbitrum, any of these language, uh, 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 networks, you can use Cartesi on top of it as well. And it's uh, EVM compatible, so you can deploy it anywhere EVM compatible. That's it from my side. That's a very high level uh, uh, overview about uh, Cartesi. What is Cartesi? Let's go a bit deeper, S kind of like real world examples. Show us some existing dApps, some ideas that might give us some inspirations. Um, also, like if you need to know more, you can check the documentation on our website. You can hear it from other developers that already developed some uh, dApps on top of Cartesi. Uh, and this is actually like you can scan the QR code, you will find a YouTube list with everyone who developed uh, on top of Cartesi, uh, very inspiring uh, uh, like uh, stories. And also, we are welcoming everyone on our uh, uh, Discord server. You can reach out to me also on Twitter. Uh, I'm Abdurrahman Amran, leading the developer relations at Cartesi, Omranik at Twitter, and we are here for the full, uh, full event. Like these two weeks, find anyone with this T-shirt, myself, Carlo, Gabriel, Lino, Max, uh, uh, and Zach, you will find us everywhere. Just find us, ask any questions, and we will be happy to help and support you. Thank you, every, everyone, and uh, yeah, let's get it back to Carlo. Hey, how are you doing, guys? Uh, pleasure to meet you. I'm Carlo. I'm from Solution Architect at Socrates. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, real cool stuff, at least to me, that was developed using our tech, OK? Uh, if any of you guys uh, have a question, uh, well, feel free to make it, OK? So how can we use Cartesi? Uh, basically, you can see Cartesi as something that enables you to do more on your web-free application. So you can further decentralize what is currently impossible. So we have multiple really cool applications that use the blockchain, but uh, the core of it is actually centralized. And that's because you don't have the tooling nor the processing power to do it. We have multiple interesting games on Web3, and the really simple ones, you can actually express them, the game logic on uh, smart contracts. But most of the games that uh, need a, a bit more of, uh, of context, of processing, they are actually centralized, and they just use the blockchain for financial layer. So with Cartesi, we expect uh, to allow you guys to actually decentralize that logic as well. Uh, also, as Omran said, we uh, are bringing a lot of tooling that have been traditionally available for Web2. And with that, we want to make sure that uh, you can express yourself better on Web3. And that's also another reason why you should be using Cartesi. And uh, you can tradition, uh, use all these traditional stacks. And finally, most of the developers, they are not used to blockchain. It's really a steep learning curve, right? You have to learn lots of new concepts, uh, new VM, new language, everything. So if you can just use the stacks that you're used to in Web2, it's much easier for you to get onboarded on making an actual decentralized application because you're using the stacks you're used to, right? So uh, let's talk a bit about the applications themselves. What's being built? So a first example that I really like, it's a game. And uh, this game is called Dinder. And it's a nice example of these kind of games that uh, traditionally would just use the blockchain for uh, uh, NFT layer and things like that. But the actual logic would have to be decentralized. So what's Dinder about? It's a mashup of an RPG game, like Pokemon, for instance, and a puzzle like Angry Crush. So basically, you have this battle in which you have your team. The other guy has this other team. You say, I want to attack this guy using this skill. And then you power it up by making a combo on a Candy Crush-like uh, shared puzzle. 
and then the other guy does the same. You can choose to either attack him really hard or to just mess up with the board so he cannot do his combo. You have your own strategy. And it's a really nice game with complex logic. The game, the game logic itself is written in Rust. And uh, well, it runs inside the Cortez machine. So when you're playing Dinder, you don't have to worry about, has someone tampered with this random number? He's doing too many combos. I think he's messing up with the random number. Oh, well, I just hit him. I should have caused like 200 damage. Did he nerf my, my character on the back end or something like that? No, we have transparency. You can just run in your machine. You can make sure that everything is all right. If someone makes a claim that's incorrect, you can just dispute it and prove it wrong. Uh, on dinner, well, they use characters as NFT. And it's a really nice game. So it's under development. I think it should be publicly available soon. So they've made this really cool Unity client, uh, really beautiful with all the skills, really cool art. art. So it's, uh, it's a nice thing to check. Another really cool application, and this one is from DeFi. It's, uh, this one was born in, uh, uh, at San Francisco. It's Nucleus. So I'm not sure if you guys uh, check this out, but uh, now and then we have like a, a DeFi hack for many reasons, right? And uh, the Nucleus guys, they were particularly uh, motivated by the Mango hack. So I'm not sure if you guys followed it, but basically on Mango hack, you have uh, this landing protocol, and you can leave uh, a coin as collateral. And uh, this guy noticed that there was a really low liquidity, highly volatile coin that he could use as a collateral. So what he did, he picked it up $5 million, he purchased it, it pumped the price a lot, then he comes to Mango and says, hey, I want 150 million stable coins, or something like that. And then, well, Mango is a Singapore protocol that has limitations. What it did, went to our Oracle, what's this asset price? It was really high because it just pumped it. Okay, so this collateral is worth this much, get it. But it wasn't good collateral. It, if you try to liquidate it, it would be worth like five million, not to 150 million. So what these guys did is, okay, how can we help this kind of thing not to happen? So they're leveraging the Cortez machine. They just feed it the prices for assets, the volumes, and other relevant information. And with that, they just uh, do a really nice analysis using NumPy and Python. And they make a model of risk for any asset. So this asset, no, it's really uh, volatile, has low liquidity. If you try to liquidate a collateral over $10,000, you won't be good. So this kind of thing wouldn't happen. No, now you're trying to use a Bitcoin or Ethereum. No, great liquidity, it's awesome. Yeah, you can like put $100,000, $1 million. Yeah, it's gonna work. So this is a really nice uh, application in, in my opinion. Another one we have that's uh, really cool. So in some places you use fingerprint reading, uh, readers for uh, clocking in and clocking out, for instance. And in some locations, well, people mess up with it. What do they do? I don't wanna work. So I just sent someone from my team with a silicone finger. He clocks in and he clocks out for me. And in these places, people start figuring out, okay, so people do this. Let's put someone watching them. So if they put a silicone finger, they'll, they'll catch it. But then uh, something else happened. This guy started asking for bribes. You pay me a bribe, you're there. You don't pay me, you're not there. So this guy had this really nice idea of making a debt for it. Because general web free applications are developed in a way in which uh, the best way is just to cooperate and do the right thing, right? You're caught if you do the nasty thing. So what he did in here is he made this really cool application in which he has uh, the input for it is your fingerprint. And then you have a C++ program that will process it with OpenCV and extract features out of that fingerprint. Cool. Now he feeds these features into a model he trained on Python. And it will tell you this fingerprint is for real. Or no, it was poofed, like someone put a, a, a photocopy of it or a silicon finger or anything like that. So I, I really like this example because it uses a lot of uh, really complex libraries that have like uh, millions of hours uh, of engineering to become a reality and, and to do really powerful stuff. Um, another game one, but this one is also has AI involved. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys play chess, but I'm assuming that at least the, some of you. So chess uh, has this problem in which people just uh, cheat. They don't play. You open an online chess, they go in there and they open a computer chess. Whatever you throw at them, they throw at the computer. And whatever the computer does with his infinite knowledge and processing power, they throw it back at you. So you're not playing versus a human, you're generally playing versus a bot. So this guy, uh, he's from a community, he said, okay, so let's change the game. 
Uh, you can play as a human, but let's focus on, I want to be a bot trainer. I want my bot to be the best chess player in the world. And that's his focus. So he, he made this ultra chess game uh, in Python, and uh, that's how it works. Basically, you submit your bot, you train your AI, you tune it, you improve it, so that you're king of the hill. And all the games, they happen inside the Cortez machine, so if someone tries to tamper with the result or anything, you can just say, hey, this is not right, and dispute it. And uh, it's a really cool game. Um, this one, on the other hand, has a web user interface, traditional JavaScript stuff, not Unity. Another really cool application is one that uh, came from uh, Indian guys, if India. So there's a lot of problems in India uh, with insurances. Sometimes, for instance, uh, it's, it's different from where I'm from, but if you um, have a car accident, for instance, they can deny you the insurance because you didn't drive in a responsible way, for instance. Okay, uh, and there's not transparency in that. They will just deny you and say, well, you're, you're a reckless driver, and you don't have a say on that. So what they are doing on here, they're trying to bring transparency to this and fairness. What they do is they build this on Python. It's a DAP in which it feeds IoT data. So uh, most cars today have this OBD2 uh, port in which you can get all the data from acceleration, braking, all the stuff. And they feed this into a model inside the Cortez machine. And it processes this data and it classify how good of a driver you are. So if you have your insurance denied, it's not because someone behind a, a wall in an office is saying so and you have no say on it and it might be unfair. No, it's actually transparent. You can verify the data is in there. You can run the model. You can check yourself. Yeah, you were an actual survivor and that's why you, you're denied the, the insurance. So it's, it's an example like a lot. Uh, this one is really cool and still on this automated gaming. So these guys in, um, in a hackathon in Boston, they had this, I, I, well, I'm a sucker for old school games, so I like this one. They basically ported this uh, Mugen-like engine for fighting games made in Go, Ikim and Go, and uh, they call it from within Python. And they have these automated fights with crazy characters. So in this guy is the Kung Fu guy versus Pichu, but they have characters like a tennis player or a delivery dude, all the crazy stuff you can think of. And before the game starts, you can wager on one of them. Then the fight happens automatically inside the Cortez machine. And then they pick up this fight simulation and they render a nice old school graphics video for you to watch what happened in the fight. Kind of like a MMA for video game people. So I think it's really interesting. And uh, well, again, you got Linux, so you can run this uh, Mugen-like emulator. You can hook it on Python for controlling it, for making the, the render video afterwards, all this cool stuff. Uh, this one is actually from uh, Bogota. So uh, generally, when you have these NFTs, uh, the certificate of ownership is on chain. The content is generally not on chain. And someone can swap your image because it's a link to a server or something like this. So these guys, they had this really cool idea, which they make procedural art on, uh, for these NFTs. And uh, they use these really cool patterns, that are fractals, using a Mandelbrot algorithm, which is a really computation-intensive algorithm. And well, uh, they did it in Rust. They're on a Linux server with a lot of computational power, so they did it. And it uh, turned out really, really nice results. So this was one of the images that they generated, for instance. And uh, with this kind of NFT, you don't own it, but you own it and it can prove you have the correct art because it's generated inside the Cortez machine. If you want to retry yourself, you just re-execute it and you regenerate and you see, yeah, I have the correct art. Uh, this one is more traditional IoT. So these guys are from Poland. And what they did is they did this uh, decentralized uh, parking application. So someone, might be the city hall, might be a DAO, might be whoever, have establishes the zones of parking and the rates and all that stuff. You park your car, you interact with this and say, hey, I want to park here for two hours, or something like this. Anyone can just go in there and check out, oh, this guy has paid parking, yeah. And he's still got like one hour, stuff like that. Um, they made a nice front end traditional with uh, Google Maps, all this stuff. Uh, and inside the Cortez machine, they build a logic using Rust. They have a SQLite database for storing all this information, for putting the new rules, like the new fares, 
for checking out uh, how many vehicles do I have, how many spots do I have left, any statistic you might perform. And that's really powerful because uh, we all know that it's, it's a real struggle to deal with data on the blockchain. It's expensive. You don't have much tooling for manipulating it. You have some things like the graph to help you out, but you have to pre-index data in a particular format. So having a database on it, it's really powerful, right? And uh, the front end was built in Vue. So yet another technology that you, they choose to use on the, on the front end. Uh, we have many other examples. I was a bit worried about the networking, so I did an address. But one crazy dude from our emulator team did something which, uh, as a nerd, I appreciate. So will it run Doom? And yeah, he put real-time Doom inside the Cortez machine. So I think it's a really nice uh, example of uh, the things you can just uh, do when you have a, a Linux machine available for your decentralized logic, right? Uh, if you guys got any ideas, got any doubts, want to discuss if your idea is viable or not, uh, if it fits, kind of adjust the architecture, anything you, you have, uh, well, we're here, we're available, and uh, we'll be really, really pleased to, to talk to you guys, OK? Um, that's my part. You have a QR code in there uh, for Discord, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, hope you guys have a really nice event, and well, have fun. I'm going to give it to my colleague, Bajos, now. Hello, hello. Hello, guys. Um, Gabriel, I'm lead developer advocate at Cartesi. I'm here to give you an idea of how everything comes together. Of course, by the end of this, we're probably going to still have some questions and some doubts. It's such a short time to explain everything. But hopefully, I get you intrigued to talk to us. So a uh, quick rundown of what I'm going to say. Like, I'll go back to rollups, app chains. Uh, talk a little bit about the Cartesian machine, how all of that is possible, the importance of fraud proof in the system, and by the end of it, I'm going to show you a little bit the APIs we developed uh, to make it possible for you to do your dApp. So rollups. Rollups are a stab at a blockchain trilemma. We all know that. Uh, it's the stab at scalability, trying to improve the TPS, uh, computational power, and by the end of it, really trying to make it cheaper to process things, right? And the idea is to make it so that in a way that you don't compromise security and decentralization. And the focus really is on computation expansion. OK, what about app chains? So when people are talking about roll apps, we like to go back here. It's a little bit what Wormeran said before. So on Ethereum network, you have this uh, massive network where you add computers to it, and you improve on security and decentralization. However, uh, you cannot really expand uh, its processing capabilities. Not really. Like, we can strive to do it, but it doesn't scale really, really well. But with app chains, it's different. So you have separate network-like uh, roll-ups where some computers might be uh, um, pre present in two different uh, apps, but they are logically separate. What it means is if by ch any chance, let's say DAP B is super successful, it's not going to steal resources from the other DAPs. It's not going to do the network eviction that we've seen so far happening in Ethereum. So uh, for those of you who are older in the space, you remember by 2016, 2017, we had a bunch of games showing up at L1. But with the DeFi explosion, there was no games anymore because it's too expensive to do anything on a game. And it doesn't make any sense. So with the idea of having uh, a dApp chain, uh, you are guaranteeing that your application is still going to stay healthy throughout time as long as people are interested in it. And you're, you're not going to be bound by what happens to the other applications that are using the same technology as you. So the ecosystem stays healthier for longer. OK, what about the Cartesian machine? So the computer you have right now, 
It has one of these architectures, AMD 64, i832, or even M1 from uh, Apple right now. And even your uh, cell phone, you have like an ARM processor. These architectures, are, they are very capable and very powerful. They are so that they are enough for you to have an operating system running on it, right? And that's really good because that gives you access to a lot of resources. Uh, you can have files, you can have network communication, you can have sockets, you can have a bunch of stuff that we forgot that exists when you're programming to the AVM, because it's more or less like a very powerful calculator. But that hinders your ability to do things. So in that sense, Cortesi used RISC-V, which is an open source version for hardware. It's an open hardware architecture, and we did an emulator on top of it. That means it's possible to run Linux, and with that, now you are able to run anything really on top of it. You still don't have access to the internet. That happens a lot. People often hear about Linux on the blockchain, and they're like, okay, can I connect to servers? Not really, because you're still bound by the blockchain data availability. However, now you can have access to files, you can have access to several types of databases inside. You don't need to uh, reinvent the query language just to make sure like, you can cross-reference data that is stored on the hash table of, of Ethereum. So that makes it much better to develop complex applications, really. And that also means that you have a very capable CPU that gives you abilities to do things that previously it was unheard of. Like, you cannot really process an image, you cannot really decrypt things, you cannot really... Uh, it's very limiting to program to, uh, on Solidity right now. And that works because you can have fraud proofs. So I told you that we did an emulator of RISC-V, but that's not compatible at all with EVM, not at first, right? So what we did, we actually uh, ported the emulator as well for the EVM. So we have a set of Solidity contracts that represents the RISC-V machine. And any instruction that can be computed off-chain can be computed on-chain as well. So what we needed to do, and we did, is a process called verification game, where let's say you're playing a game for a week. Now it's finished, and somebody is complaining something about the game. They're saying somebody uh, is doing something nasty. You can just do a search, a binary search, basically, on the uh, whole process and find a single CPU instruction and put all the data necessary for that on chain. It's super cheap, by the way, and do one single CPU instruction cycle on chain and verify who's telling the truth. So it's very simple thing, actually, to verify the computation you did outside with all that thing that, that, that we are just saying, like with OS, abstractions, Java virtual machine if you want to, databases and whatnot. And this is kind of like how it looks like. So you have a set of nodes here. That includes the Ethereum node, because we still need to have access to uh, data. You're still bound by the data availability problem. But then you have other nodes from Cortesi here. And your front end, any kind of UI, really, you connect using some of these uh, endpoints. And from within the Cortesi machine, the Linux machine we're talking about, we created this API abstraction here that makes it much easier for you to integrate with uh, the outside world. Let's take a look at the inside first. So from the inside, we have that uh, API I was talking about. It has just a, f a few endpoints that you need to know of. The documentation is super nice for that. Uh, first, you, you need to be uh, calling this endpoint over here that will tell that you're ready to process the next transaction. So this is still a state machine. So whenever you have a new input, a transaction, it wakes up, processes the information, and it finishes. So it's a loop where you're always calling finish at the end to tell the system that you're done. You're waiting for the next uh, query. Now, you have two main states of how to process this new uh, information. So whenever you have Ethereum call, for those of you who are uh, more uh, familiarized with uh, JSON RPC from Ethereum, 
basically you're waking up the machine to process something, but you don't intend it to store it. You don't intend to have a straight transition. So that's why we have inspect state over there. So if you need to query about anything uh, of the state of the machine, you can just call inspect state. From outside, you're going to see that. And from, with, from within the machine, you need to be um, aware that the machine is going to revert. So let's say you have a counter there. Whenever you have a call, you uh, add one to it. That thing is always going to be zero and, and a one. You can't change state when you are in that uh, particular uh, set uh, of, of, the, of the state of the machine. Then there is advanced state. That's just like a normal transaction on AVM. That, happen, that, that means that you need to be cautious, uh, to have caution, because if you break your DAP, if you break your contract, it might be a Python contract, might be a Java application uh, acting as a contract, but if you break that, then your DAP is gone, just like the EVM. And then you have the three main types of outputs out over there. So let's start with the simpler one, add report. So when you add a report, it's basically an ephemeral information. It's like logging uh, information in your application. It's something that is only going to show on your node. Uh, of course, if people reproduce the same code as you, they're going to see that as well. But it's not tied to the state. Then you have notices. Notices are like Ethereum events with, with a special uh, twist to it. So an ERC-20 transfer, uh, e uh, how to say? Uh, it has an event to it that you can uh, verify by running the Ethereum node. But if anybody gives you the payload of the event, you cannot verify that that's true unless you go back to the transaction that created it and verify by running it again. However, notice here they have a Merkle proof to it that is tied to the state of the rollup. So whatever information you get from a notice is just a string, really, of data. You can verify the... Uh, veracity of it uh, by having the worker proof to, to that. So it's an Ethereum event with a special touch to it. And finally, we have a voucher. We call them vouchers because uh, rollups, they need the seven day window of um, fraud um, detection and so people can open disputes. So you can only do transactions really once the state is settled and people agree that there is no changes uh, gonna happen anymore. So you create vouchers, basically transactions, and people can claim this, those vouchers once the state uh, is finalized. Uh, so these are basically, um, this endpoint is basically the way you're gonna interact back with the Ethereum network. So somebody uh, wants some tokens and they need to withdraw, it's gonna be our ESC20 transfer voucher that they're gonna claim later on. Okay, these are from within. These are what you need to know when you're writing your contract. From without, there are the APIs that we're talking about. Let's just go back there for quick. Um, the JSON RPC and two APIs for the Ethereum node over here. The JSON RPC is basically for the data availability. So you call on a contract, a roll-up contract on Ethereum, the function add input. It's basically just to register information going inside the rollup uh, ecosystem. Uh, it's not going to do anything, really. It's just so we can agree on the information there. Uh, that, that is what synchronizers have been doing for us in other rollups, by the way. Uh, so you have as a comparison. And then you can query outputs from the GraphQL API. You, the outputs are the reports, notices, and vouchers I was talking about earlier. So whatever you produce from inside, that's how you get from the outside using the GraphQL API. Finally, you can have the inspect state. Basically, you are free to do with that whatever you want. So you can register sub um, routes to the inspect state. So it's from with, within the application you define those. So you can really do something like a REST API if you wish to do so. And those are going to come as a high-level inspect state API call from, what, from the outside. And finally, you can execute voucher, the thing I was talking about. So whenever a voucher is already valid and settled, you can just call execute voucher. Then a new Ethereum transaction is going to happen coming from the rollup address inside the Ethereum network. I know it's a, a bunch of stuff, 
But we're going to have uh, five to ten minutes at the end of the presentation to talk about these, and you can ask questions. So for the next session, uh, Luna is going to go through a programming uh, DAP uh, with you, and you can just get your Linux, because that's the best for this. Thank you. Aqui passa e esse botãozinho é o laser. Hi there. So I'm Lino from Solution Architect team. And we are going to, uh, uh, so we are going to, uh, just a quick, uh, quick start on how to uh, uh, get into Cartesi. So uh, now you should go to your terminal and your Unix environment works, but uh, uh, we advise you to use Gitpod. There's a link on our uh, GitHub repo. So uh, in, this, in this exercise, we're going to run the Echo Python, which is a very simple example. And we are then go going to make some changes and see uh, how it behaves. And yeah, um, so that's for today. <laughs> so this will just clone the REPL, build the Cartesi machine, and start the Echo frontend, which is a web interface. So. And so you just, if you're using um, uh, Gitpod, it, it will be automatically clone the, the, the repo for you. But it's just, you have to ju uh, go to the Rolex examples and the Echo Python example. And then from, them, from there, we'll build the image which contains your, the Echo Python code. So we use Docker to set up all the environment. And uh, the first thing, you have to build the, the Docker image with the Cartesi, uh, with the, the Echo Python code. And then you can start the backend, uh, which starts all the, the uh, infrastructure for uh, run the, the Python. So has all the node, uh, the, the, the part that reads the, the state uh, on the blockchain, also the, the, the what uh, handle the information. So we just Docker compose and, and put all the, 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 the configuration files and we'll, it will run the deploy a local hard hat chain so yeah, you can test everything locally, and and then it, it, it takes a little bit of time to set up. But if you do this, it, it's in uh, yeah, a couple of, 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 of seconds. It it should work. And then uh, to the front end, you just change the directory to start a new uh, terminal in to the Echo front end. You have to install the dependencies. All of these uh, instructions, by the way, are on our, 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 our GitHub repo of Rolex examples. So we, you have to uh, use Yarn to get all the instructions, uh, all the dependencies. And then you can start the front end. So by now, uh, you can, uh, it will start the, the, the web interface, and you can uh, send the transactions. On the other side, the, well, all the, the, the Cartesi uh, rollups node that well, they are running, so the hard hat, hard hat local chain, the, 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 inspect, uh, the, the, the inspect server, the graphical, all those interfaces that Gabriel said. And you can see the, that uh, it, it re uh, reads the, the state of the local chain and uh, then gets the, the output from the graphical. So yeah, it, it, when it reads, you, you will get the response. So one thing that's very important when you are developing with Cartesi, since it start, starts a, a, a whole environment using using several Docker, Docker uh, containers, 
it's important that you stop and uh, remove the, the, the volumes and the containers. Otherwise, the volumes won't be removed and you'll have, a, a, uh, you have a, a old, old uh, information on site. So you, uh, every time that you do, you have to control C it and then and then you have to uh, stop the containers with Docker Compose down dash V. So now it's a uh, control C. And then you have to just put down dash V. Yeah. And it stops and removes uh, everything else. So now you're going to, you're going to make some changes to the Echo Python. And then we're going to see uh, how it behaves using a, a console version of the front end. Yeah, just, just make a simple change. We're going to make, uh, change how, how, the, how, how it, uh, the answers. So now I, I here I'm copying some, uh, some of the, the functions. So all the informations that when they get inside the Cartesian machine, when you're going to process, they come as a hex, uh, hex encoded. So you, in order to change and to, to see them as a strings, you should uh, decode it from hex. So that's what I'm doing here. And then we're going to change the string and see what happens. So, and now we are going to change and add a little, uh, change the string there. Then we have to hex encode it again. So, cave echoes, yeah. And for you, we have to do the reverse when uh, we are outputting the, the message. So I have to uh, encode as a hex as well. And then you have to start it again, the, the, the backend. And you have to rebuild. Since I changed the code, I have to rebuild the, the Cartesian machine uh, with the new code. So it's just run the same command that we ran using the, the same uh, Docker build X big load. It should be uh, fast since it's a small change just to uh, put the, the, new, the new code there. And then we can, uh, just after, we can start again the, 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 the rollups framework. Yeah, it's just start, and yeah, it should be ready to go. Now we are going to test the, the, test the changes with the front end console. So we go to the front end console. It's, uh, th this one is more uh, general for, for you to interact with the application because you have several other commands inside. So uh, if, when you're developing, maybe this one's better, and then we, you can build the, the beautiful framework using web interface and everything that you want. So just uh, yarn start and do the send an input to the rollups framework with the payload. And you can, uh, you can see put away anything that you want. It will convert to, to hex to put inside the, 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 to the, the, the local chain. Uh, just send another one. And then we can check the changes. So just list, it's notice list, and you can see the cave echoes, hello. Yeah. So this was uh, just a quick presentation and on how, how it works. We have uh, other interface that we can test, like the vouchers, the, all, the, the, all the other languages. And you, you can always uh, come to see us and uh, if you have more doubts on how to build, we'll be available. So yeah, you know, we have we got some time. So guys, uh, any questions, doubts, suggestions, uh, anything? Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Yes, I'm scared to. All right, okay, I asked a billion questions, so maybe there will be a lack of context, but... <laughs> um, okay, I guess my, my main question is how does, when you, when you have uh, application-based uh, validation and uh, nodes, how do you reach consensus on global state, things like tokens? Okay. So basically, uh, as we said, we have this platform in which you can deploy your application-specific rollup wherever you want. So the resources that you put in it are associated with the underlying chain. So if you're running Ethereum, you will be handling with uh, Ethereum SCs, this kind of stuff. And uh, those live on the underlying chain for their consensus, all this stuff. On our level, which is the Cortez level, uh, what happens is that uh, you don't need local consensus. So it's not like uh, I have 10 people validating this application. If uh, six of, of them want to do something nice, they will do it. That's not our, how our security works. The way our security works is you need to trust that at least one validating party will enforce the correct result. And why is that? Because the way our system is secured is when you have someone that makes a claim on chain, they basically pick up the Cartes machine state and they build a Merkle that index it and they put it on chain, the root hash. And they say, at this point, this is what I got. Any of the validators will do the same stuff. They will check, okay, do I have the same root hash as this guy claimed? Yes, nothing to do. It's an application roll up. If not, then we have a dispute. And how do we settle the dispute? We have this protocol called verification game, which uh, is being used for other projects as well. But the, basically what happens is the Cartesian machine needs to be deterministic so I can reproduce computation. So if I'm not agreeing with you, it means that at least in one point we did something different. The protocol identifies what's this first point. What's the first instruction of risk five execution in which I had the exact same state as you, but after doing it, it can be sum, sum two members, or a subtraction, or a write of a value member, any instruction. After that, we don't have matching signatures anymore. That's the first part of the protocol. And the second part is, well, we had a huge effort on implementing a Cartesian machine emulator on chain. So once you reach this single instruction in which you don't agree, then you're actually being secured by the underlying chain. That instruction is executed by its own chain emulator. So if it's Ethereum, it's going to be thousands and thousands of nodes. And they're going to have the consensus on this is the hash of the Cortez machine after executing the single instruction. So you're right or you're wrong. But it's not those 10 validators or 20 or 30. It's actually the entire Ethereum community or whatever blockchain you're using saying you're right or you're wrong. OK? Um, I hope I, I, I answered your question. Not sure. Yeah, uh, keep throwing. So, but if yourself. anyone else wants to ask something, yeah. okay. Sure. Yeah, the, just hold on for me a second. So um, when it's um, the consensus protocols running in the Cartesian machine, mm -hmm. uh, is it um, across all, like the Cartesian rollup across all of uh, Cartesian machines or only on the app chains? Uh, okay, so uh, as we said, the, the point is that how can we uh, remove the constraints on processing? So I have a computer. It only has so much processing power. If I try to validate everything that's going on, either everything that's going on is going to be tiny or I'm not going to validate everything. So the way we chose was, okay, so you choose what you're validating. And uh, a Cartesian node only validates a single application that you're interested in. So this Cartesian node for this specific application will look for this uh, special smart contracts of our framework. And there are certain transactions they will look for. Like there's a new input for this application. OK, I'm going to react to it. I'm going to feed it to my Cortez machine. I'm going to step on it. And when someone makes a claim, do I have the same hash? Yes, I don't have to do anything. I don't, then I'm going to interact. Uh, in the logical sense, you can be a single validator because uh, you're a validator giving your address. But physically, you can have a cluster of machines. So you have a server that's validating a single application that's really demanding. Then you have another server using the same wallet, so you're the same validator, but it's validating a much lightweight uh, application, so you ha can have like five or six applications. I, I have a really high uh, volume uh, game that's pumping lots of users. Well, maybe I would need like a really, a really large server just for it. So uh, it depends on the application in the end. And again, uh, since you don't have to validate everything, you choose to be a validator for application or not, uh, you can manage your resources. 
Okay, and just to follow up on that, like mm -hmm. if um, you have like two different dApps running mm -hmm. on uh, across TZ, so um, what prevents like uh, like double spending, let's say, of some token on like both? Okay, so that's a great question. So what happens is uh, the execution environment is the Cortez machine itself. So for your dApp, the reality is what's on that Linux server of yours. Uh, how do you interact with the outside world? So basically, uh, in the framework, there's a special smart contract called the portal. And what's a portal? The portal is a bridge for assets. So whenever you interact with the portal and you deposit some asset, like uh, let's say you're on Ethereum and you deposit Ether, you get a special input on the Cortez machine to handle. It's going to say, hey, X deposited Y Ether. Handle with it. You might save it on a database. You might uh, award him uh, a token because he was purchased a token, uh, an item, whatever. It's up to your logic. But that asset is in that portal, and that portal is from your application. Now you say, OK, great. So we have a, a, a way in. What's the way out? So uh, as Bach has explained, one of the possible outputs in the Cortez machine is called a voucher. And what's a voucher? The Cortez machine needs to be isolated because it's deterministic. So you cannot directly interact with internet uh, or a blockchain or anything like that. But still, uh, it's interesting for you to interact with the blockchain. So that's what vouchers are for. So basically, you, you set the transaction you want to execute. You cannot execute yourself, but you pack it on this voucher. And then someone on the outside can enforce it. So they submit this voucher into the framework, and the smart contracts will check things like, OK, so this is going to transfer, for instance, uh, Ether from the portal to you, because you, you're allowed to withdraw 5 Ether or this NFT or some resource. And that's where double spending comes in. So how do you make sure you don't have double spending? OK, the answer is you, the voucher can only be submitted and executed once that computation is final. So it's a roll-up uh, roll uh, solution. So once you roll up the state, you have dispute period. There can be disputes, there can be no disputes. But after it's settled, in that moment, you have a proof that's generated associated with, with your voucher. And that proof is validated by the framework when you try to execute it. So if you try to execute a voucher that uh, it's not final yet, like, I want to withdraw this item. Yeah, but uh, you cannot, because uh, it's not final that you are awarded this item. It's still in the dispute period. You're not going to be able to do it. Another thing is, OK, so I have this voucher. I submitted it. I'm going to submit it again. You're not going to make it, because these smart contracts also keep tab on the vouchers that were already executed or not. So I have all these validations to make sure that when you execute a voucher, you're actually uh, entitled to doing that action. It's valid. No one submitted it before. No, there's no double spending, anything like that. OK, thank you. Awesome. I have a question about timing. Sure. Um, you have two virtual machines executed by two miners, or what? Two. Mm -hmm. Say they're executing the same instance. Now, an event occurs, and mm -hmm. the event somehow crosses over to the virtual machine. How do I know that both of them get the same event at the same time? So uh, in the physical world time, it, it will probably not be it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point is that every input that goes into the Cortez machine is uh, ordered by the blockchain itself. So inputs to the Cortez machine, they come through the blockchain. So in the framework, there's a special smart contract uh, that has a method called add input. So all mm -hmm. the inputs that go to the Gertaz machine come through this add input, except for portal ones, because they're another one. But once again, the, the blockchain itself is the one ordering events. So you know that you have uh, a deterministic order on the inputs. And uh, different instances of the Cortez machine, one running on my machine, one running on yours, won't have different orders of events or won't have uh, different inputs available. So that's what guarantees uh, that we have the same inputs. So all of them stop? And they're stopped. When okay. an input happens, they go again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, got it, got it. That, that, that wasn't clear. But what happens inside the Cortez machine is you have basically an iterator on your software. Whenever there's a new input available, it wastes up the Cortez machine, and you get the next thing. You process it, and then you say, OK, this is the result. It's good, or it's not good, refuse it. And when you do it, the Cortez machine stops. And it stops until there's something else to process. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, like like DVM basically. Um, so we still got time if you guys have some additional question, maybe. A question. I have a question. Huh? Can you run zero knowledge in Cartesi? Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Good question. So we have this fight about zero knowledge versus so optimistic. Uh, in my humble opinion, uh, it's not a good fight because there are different tools and they have different properties. Sometimes it's better to use one the other. But uh, yeah, answering your question. So for instance, one of the applications we made a while ago was a poker game. And uh, to, to my best knowledge, it was the first uh, truly decentralized poker game. And how did we achieve it? So poker has some uh, very interesting properties like I want to fold. I don't want to reveal my cards, but at the same time, uh, if I bluff or anything and I try to cheat on which cards I had, uh, I got to be caught, right? Because you got to enforce the correct result. So for this specific problem, for instance, uh, we actually use zero knowledge. So it's a Linux server. You can run stuff. So we had this really nice uh, German researcher that uh, does a lot of research on menthol poker, which is the model we implemented. And he built a C++ library that actually implements uh, zero knowledge proofs to handle some of the, the problems involved in this, and we just use it. So C++ library, import it, uh, run it. So we have this Cartesian application that's an optimistic roll-up solution. But yeah, we're making use of zero knowledge to solve a particular problem in which it makes sense to us. Which uh, basically you, you, you still you have a way to prove that you had that card, but if you just fold, no one knows what you had. And yeah, zero knowledge was the answer for that. So. Questions? Yeah. Well, uh, I think we're good. Thank you very much for all the attention. Uh, your time is precious. We appreciate it. Uh, don't feel embarrassed or anything about talking to us. Uh, we're really approachable, I guess. And uh, I'm really excited about seeing what you guys are building. Uh, all these things I showed up, uh, most of it is from hackathons, so it always blows my mind uh, how creative you guys can get. So yeah, good luck to everyone, and uh, let's chat. Bye-bye. Okay.